friends! Welcome to the Abrams Children's Books Fall 2020 Preview. My name is Jenny Choi, Associate Director of School and Library Marketing. Let's dive right in. Let's explore the world of nonfiction for readers of all ages. I'm a big fan of sports documentaries like 30 for 30, so it's no surprise that the book I'm most excited to share with all of you from this season is Above the Rim. In this picture book biography, Kidlit All-Stars Jim Bryan and Frank Morrison introduce a new generation of sports fanatics to Elgin Baylor, basketball icon and civil rights advocate. A member of the early scrappy National Basketball Association and one of the first professional African American players, Elgin took risks on and off the court. He was known for his acrobatic style of moving and shooting, and he even inspired others like Dr. J to get creative with their game. But when traveling for away games, some hotels and restaurants turned Elgin away because of the color of his skin. Then on one particular night, Elgin had had enough, and he staged a one-man protest that captured the attention of the media, the public, and the NBA. As you can see, the art in this book is simply stunning. Frank Morrison has really outdone himself here. It's incredible to see how he captures emotions and even swag in his paintings. I can't wait for you to check it out. And now I turn it over to our talented authors who will tell you more about their books. Hi, my name's John Hendricks. I'm talking to you today from my studio in St. Louis, and I'm excited to share with you today a little bit about my new book. It's called Go and Do Likewise, The Parables and Wisdom of Jesus. So William Barclay said that for Jesus, the whole wide world was the garment of the living God. I love this quote because it really reminds me of just how rich and unusual Jesus' teaching style was. He taught in not platitudes, but in stories, and the stories we still know today. In fact, many of you are probably familiar with uh, the Good Samaritan, the Prodigal Son, the Lost Sheep. Uh, these are uh, timeless stories, and he told them not to amuse, but to unpack the mysteries of God's love and to inaugurate a brand new kind of gospel and relationship that Jesus was bringing to the world. And his stories were part of that. So in this book, which is set in the same world as Miracle Man, I use some of these stories uh, and some of these word pictures that Jesus created to help talk about this unusual man and his unusual teachings. But today I wanted to talk about a particular piece of art that I love in the book. Um, all the images were really exciting to create. One, because Jesus spoke in visual metaphors and different than just painting a picture of the scene that Jesus was in, similar to Miracle Man, where we got to see the world around Jesus as he was performing miracles. In this book, we're set in more of a conceptual space were set in the storytelling that Jesus framed himself. And one of my favorite images in the book, it's not the most elaborate image, but it's the one that honestly every time I sat down to work on it, it made me tear up a little bit. And that's not because I'm a great draftsman and I cry at the sight of my own work. It's the story of the prodigal son. Now you may not know what prodigal means, but uh, it's kind of an unusual word. Uh, it really means extravagant or wasteful. And unfortunately, I think the story being known as the prodigal son is a bit of a misnomer. It really should be the prodigal father. The image I want to share with you today is the image of the son when he's walked away from his father's family. He's spent all of his inheritance and wasted everything his father gave him. And the son is convinced he will no longer be loved by his father if he returns home. But as he's coming back, eager to offer his explanation, his apologies for what he did, he sees his father running towards him. And the father runs out and lifts him off the ground and hugs him and kisses him and welcomes him back into the family. It's a very poignant image in the story 
And in fact, the prodigal son, the, the parable of the prodigal son, could really be said to represent the entire new gospel that Jesus was teaching to his disciples and to his listeners. So I hope you enjoy looking at that image, and I hope you enjoy reading this book. Uh, I had a lot of fun making it, and I really hope you get a chance to read it. Thank you. Bye. Hello. So my name is Freya Hartas, and I'm the illustrator of Slow Down, um, which is a book that celebrates little moments in nature that happen around us every day. Um, some things that we often miss in our, every, in our everyday busy lives. Uh, things like how dew collects on a, on a leaf, um, or like how a bee pollinates a flower. Our aim with the book was to encourage children and grown-ups to slow down enough uh, and just stop and just appreciate those little moments that unfold just outside the window, um, on the walk to school and in their own back gardens. You can read about how rainbow forms, the next time you see a rainbow when you're walking the park you'll know how it got there. Uh, it was important when approaching the illustrations that they were factual and accurate, uh, but also that we wanted them to feel friendly and cosy. We didn't want it to come across as too clinical or textbooky. They needed to be educational, but also fun and narrative driven. I wanted to share this spread of the snake shedding its skin, one of my favourite spreads actually, uh, because it's quite a good example of that scientific and friendly combo. Uh, snakes are the type of animal that lots of people are scared of in real life. Uh, they're often the villains of children's stories, um, you know, they've just got quite a bad rep. <laughs> poor, poor guys. Um, I wanted to show our snake in a positive light, so I've given him a little smile. Um, he even has a cheeky grin as he sheds his skin, which is a fascinating, if not slightly gruesome, process, which kids love, of course. I think it was extra important that we sort of showed these animals in this friendly, nice light, because we wouldn't want to put anyone off seeing these amazing events, which um, obviously in real life can sometimes be a bit icky, but they're you know, they're not bad things, they're, they're sort of amazing things. Following on from that, I, I really enjoyed creating these cosy, quiet spaces uh, that are animals' habitats, uh, especially in the, these pond scenes. Uh, there's something lovely about that space where the, the water meets the river bank, where these animals live secret lives amongst water reeds. Uh, working on this book has actually helped me notice the natural world around me more. Um, now I love walking in the woods and spotting uh, hidden burrows and those little living spaces um, of all these wonderful creatures. Hi, I'm here to talk to you about Bill Nye's Great Big World of Science. You might have noticed that I am not Bill Nye. My name's Gregory Moan. I co-authored the book with him. We also wrote a series of novels, Jack and the Geniuses. And when we were working on those together, we said, ah, you know, we really got to do a big book of science, something with everything in there that would really get kids excited. So that's where Bill Nye's Great Big World of Science came from. And this book really has everything. I mean, it's got 30 plus absurdly profound experiments that kids could do at home or in the classroom. It's got some of the biggest mysteries in the universe, like what is dark matter and what is it, dark energy? And do aliens exist? All the way down to like everyday mysteries, such as uh, why do apples turn brown? Okay, it's even got it's even got Bill Nye bad jokes. And they're really wonderful bad jokes. Um, we cover almost every scientific field. We've got astronomy, astrophysics, chemistry, earth science, climate science, of course, zoology, um, and even botany. Who knew botany could be so fascinating? Really interesting stuff. Now, this book isn't just from us, right? I mean, we went out there and interviewed more than 75 different scientists, experts in their field, at all stages of, the, of their career. This incredibly, awesomely diverse mix of scientists. And we asked them, hey, what do you think kids need to know about your field? And that's really what drove this book. Um, we are so excited to get it out there. Um, I know Bill's excited because I got more late night emails from him than I care to remember. Again, it's Bill Nye's Great Big World of Science. It's designed to inspire the next generation of scientists or at least curious adults. And can't wait for you to check it out. Hi, I'm Carrie Hollihan to tell you about my new book, Ghosts Unveiled. It's in a series for readers like you that's called Creepy and True. Now, I've written about mummies. They are creepy and true. Plus, I'm working on a project about bones, and that would be victims of mayhem and murder, both creepy and true. 
But when Abelman's Books for Young Readers asked me to write a book about ghosts, I had to think about it. I asked myself, ghosts are creepy, but are ghosts true? I started reading ghost stories, lots of ghost tales. But then I realized that these were stories, not real accounts of people's ghostly experiences. So I began to ask around, and what I discovered is pretty darn cool. Many, many folks have had encounters with ghosts. I spoke with people from Australia, Korea, and Canada. I read reports, lots of them, from Mexico, Ethiopia, Japan, China, India, Scotland, and Sweden. And what I learned has filled this book. There are ghosts on trains and ghosts on planes, plus ghosts on pirate ships, as well as ghosts in the United States Capitol and ghosts in the Kremlin in Russia. Ghosts of Abraham Lincoln, a ghost of Anne Boleyn, a ghost of Captain Kidd, and two more creepy English rulers who each lost his head. Our four-footed friends like dogs and cats pay us ghostly visits too. But the best part was interviewing my family. We have a ghost story that took place in my room when I was a very little girl. Then there's my nephew's encounter with the ghost of a small boy. And much more recently, a sighting right in my no neighborhood in Blue Ash, Ohio. You might not think ghosts are true, but when you lay eyes on Ghosts Unveiled, you might have second thoughts. Hello, my friends. My name is Joseph Bruchak, and I'm here today to talk about a new book of mine called One Real American, which tells the story of Ely Parker, a Native American from the 19th century who led an incredibly interesting life. Now, when I was young, I have to admit that the books, the movies, and the television I saw all presented Native Americans in very stereotyped ways, either as vanishing people or as murdering savages, which didn't seem right to me, me as a person of Native ancestry and one who knew Native people, I saw them as just other human beings. It inspired in me a lifelong interest in trying to find out the stories, the traditions, and the history, and then sharing it with others, especially young people who would have books and information that I was not fortunate enough to have when I was young. One of the most fascinating stories I learned was that of Ely Parker. I learned it not just from books and years of research, but also from listening to Native elders, especially people such as Dahana Dolan's or Ray Fadden, who was the founder of the Six Nations Indian Museum in Anchiota, New York. Ely Parker was a man who walked in two worlds and did so with dignity and honor in both. He was born in Western New York, what is now called Western New York, on Seneca land. And he, as a young man, worked tirelessly to prevent his Tonawanda reservation from being taken from the native people. He also became a Grand Sachem, or a chief at an early age, then went on to go to school, to become a civil engineer, a highly educated man by any standards for his time, and close friends with someone named Ulysses S. Grant, the same man who would be a famous general the American Civil War. Parker was not only present at the surrender of the Southern troops, but wrote down the terms of that surrender. And when Robert E. Lee, the commanding general of the South, was introduced to Ely Parker, he looked at him, recognized him as a Native American, and said, I'm glad to see there's one real American here. To which Parker responded, General, we are all Americans. Hi everybody, cartoonist Nathan Hale here, talking about book number 10 in the Hazardous Tales series. What's it going to be about? It's about a land purchase, the Louisiana Purchase. We know that Thomas Jefferson bought this giant chunk of North America, but why did he do it? And what started it off? The book begins 
with a look at some of the first European explorers to go into the Louisiana Territory. We talk about their adventures and see what happened to them. There's also a lot in this book about mosquitoes. What do they have to do with the Louisiana Purchase? There's some great stuff in the book about the French Revolution where everybody gets their heads cut off. During the French Revolution, there was a little guy going around, a young soldier by the name of Napoleon Bonaparte. He has a lot to do with the Louisiana Purchase. And his adventures are here in Book 10. Thomas Jefferson was absolutely obsessed with New Orleans. It's sort of the thing that kicked off the entire adventure of buying the Louisiana Purchase. One of the most important aspects of the entire story is the Haitian Revolution. In fact, it's so important that that's the cover of Book 10. Right on the cover is the great Haitian leader Toussaint Louverture. The book is called Blades of Freedom. Everything you ever wanted to know about the Louisiana Purchase is in this book. Check it out, Blades of Freedom, Book 10 in the Hazardous Tales series.